you could actually do that, and it would be uh, very realistic. Uh, all of that, I think, is quite uh, plausible. Remember Mohammed Atta? There was everything about Mohammed Atta, the so-called pilot of the first plane to hit the North Tower, September 11th, 2001. Atta gave every sign that he thought he was going home that night to his discotheque, to his favorite prostitute, to his cocaine, and to his booze. He th all of that stuff uh, going on. So in this case, we have these two people who seem to have a um, sort of normal middle-class life. He's got a job. Uh, they're going to get married. They're going to have a child or have one already. Uh, doesn't that look like they thought they were actors in that drill, and then somehow the, the tables were turned and they get, uh, they get uh, offed? Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So let's take a look at this once again. The hypothesis I have is that the two um, individuals now deceased. Originally it was three, huh? That's another giveaway, right? That there's a third shooter who has disappeared from the narrative after a couple of days, right? We've had that. Um, but in this case, I say these are quite likely actors in a drill. In other words, they thought they were part of this active shooter exercise, uh, which we have confirmed from the Victorville... Valley News, as well as from National Public Radio. You can even hear the interview with the head of the SWAT team, who says, we were, we were drilling exactly what then happened. That's always a very disturbing sign in terms of the veracity. Uh, so their actions cannot be explained in terms of any n normal motive of everyday life. And because of that, and because of the importance of this event, you've got to then look around and say, well, doesn't it look like they were... Uh, then these people were were pawns of the intelligence agencies. And the obvious thing is, if the if the two of them, or if one of them comes to this Christmas party or whatever this gathering is, and then leaves, and then the two of them supposedly come back, how about the one guy goes home? At that point, um, dark forces, right, the rogue network, eliminate both of them, um, kill them bring the bodies along, uh, deposit them at the scene, and doubles to do the shooting. Why not? Doubles, right? From Mohammed Merah to all sorts of other events, right? Doubles. Uh, doppelganger. So I think that's, that's where you would have to work. So let us be extremely skepticism. Oh, and of course, the fact that this morning, right, dramatically between 10, 10 and 11, that the woman had pledged allegiance to ISIS is finally found on Facebook. Oy, uh, this I would not trust. This is uh, an attempt to shore up a story which had caused more puzzlement than anything else. They want to direct it, right? They want to somehow get some, some uh, hype going about ISIS. All right. The highway bill has gone through. Five years, $300 billion plus. Um, that's pathetic. The uh, American Society of Civil Engineers gives the U.S. infrastructure a D grade. This is barely enough to keep it at a D grade. It, it's enough to keep it maybe from going to F, but it's still going to be a D. The Tax Wall Street Party calls for the seizure of the Federal Reserve, a bill through Congress that says the Federal Reserve is now going to put out $5 trillion of 0% 100-year federal credit through the subcontractors who are the governors, mayors, county executives of the United States to rebuild the highway system, the railway system, the water systems, the electrical grid, and every other aspect of national infrastructure, ports and docks, you name it. We want $5 trillion for that. We want $1 trillion plus, probably up to about $1.3 or $1.4 at this point, to refinance on an emergency basis all student loans into the 0% category. Now, Madame Yellen has been opening her yap this week. She's already crowing that her stewardship is so great that we're going to be able to have higher interest rates thanks to her. Isn't that great that she's proven how effective she can be? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the U.S. economy has been propped up since the world derivatives panic and Wall Street bankruptcies of 2008 by, first of all, stimulus, uh, an $800 billion stimulus of $400 to $500 billion supplemental. That kept things going from 08 to, uh, well, 09, 10, 11. 
we've had three rounds of QE. QE1, quantitative easing one, quantitative easing two, quantitative easing three. Uh, the problem with those, of course, is that those were support operations for bankrupt, kited, rotten, toxic derivatives to keep the zombie banks alive. Now, that, that's a terrible policy. The only thing worse than that is what the libertarian lunatics want, which is to drive the entire system into uh, a panic bankruptcy, a deflationary crash. And they say, like Andrew Mellon, liquidate stocks, liquidate bonds, liquidate real estate, liquidate the farmer, liquidate labor, liquidate everything. Too bad if you died. So um, we used to have QE3, but now that has been over for one year, huh? one year after the end of QE3. And then the other part of this three-legged stool keeping things going is a 0% interest rate. Now, when Yellen takes that away, things are going to get ugly. They're already getting ugly, right? The volatility of the stock market this week, I would say, is bad. This, on the whole, is a recipe for the Morgenthau uh, New Deal recession imposed by Morgenthau, speaking for Wall Street, against the wishes of Franklin D. Roosevelt, because even then you had a factionalized government with Wall Street favoring one group over another. So if you have money in stocks, if you have money in bonds, I would, this weekend, take a very careful look at that. Uh, is it time to take some profits? Is it time to diversify? Is it time to shift some of your assets into different asset categories. It may well be. So look at that. Uh, you got about one week before this uh, Annie Oakley here is going to pull the trigger and uh, quite positively set off a panic. And if you're, if you're a third world economy, right, those places are going to be in bad shape. Because once the U.S. interest rates start going up, there's the giant sucking sound of all the hot money fleeing out of South Africa, Brazil, and all these other places. This may be one of the goals, right? They want to collapse those bubbles as we go. Now, let us shift briefly to the problem of fascism. Uh, this is now a highly relevant and timely issue. As you know, uh, I have always regarded fascism as very much a live issue. Uh, and there are strong fascist tendencies in many parts of society, certainly in the Democratic Party, certainly in the Republican Party, even more. Uh, you remember 10 years ago, I was talking about neocon fascist madmen, the Wolfowitzes and Fythes and people like this, the uh, Cheneys, the, uh, the whole group of them. Um, those guys uh, essentially do fit into these uh, categories. So... Uh, we need, however, to understand fascism in a broader sense. Now, this is a two-sided coin. The average American thinks of fascism and Nazism mainly in terms of Hitler, and this is mainly in terms of the persecution of the Jews, uh, which, of course, was a very important feature of the Nazi regime. Now, ironically, this narrow view, in other words, forgetting all about the epistemology, the philosophy, other things that don't have to do with this specifically. Nevertheless, today, uh, we've had the Paris events of November 13th. We've then had Donald Trump come out with what amounts to Nazi uh, policies, fascist and indeed Nazi policies. He wants to uh, shut down mosques, and the idea was lots of mosques. He wants to have a registry of everybody who's a Muslim, clearly unconstitutional. Uh, and he wants uh, essentially to bar people from public office. These are all Nazi measures. And this has allowed people to understand <laughs> what he's about. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So talking about fascism, uh, the topic has always been a very timely one. And now Trump, with his post-November 13th, post-Paris ravings about what should happen to Muslims in the United States, has now made it even more uh, a la page, right, more, uh, more relevant to, uh, to where we are right now. You have to understand that um, there is a structure to this, right? He's, oh, Trump uh, says in most famous raving of the it's the last 10 days. He says that people in Jersey City were dancing and celebrating when they saw the Twin Towers come down. Well, I'm afraid I don't see any evidence of that uh, happening on the waterfront involving Muslims. What we do have, of course, are those Carl Cameron reports, which talk about um, 
a moving van company, presumably staffed by members of the Israeli Mossad, who were filming the event uh, from a rooftop. And I think the origin of what uh, this urban legend that uh, Trump has is actually in those Carl Cameron reports. And those those reports, those Israeli um, uh, uh, moving men dancing on the roof and filming it with some kind of a you know a video setup. It it is very likely that uh, that this is what he's what he's referring to. But of course he can't he can't face it in this um, sense. Now the structure of this is what he says. And, and by the way, those Israeli moving men, you know, they went back to Israel. They were interviewed on Israeli TV. They were held in jail by the United States for some months. So they were observing it. Now, let's not go crazy over observing, right? Doing something is one thing. Making it happen, that's one thing. To observe it is quite another. Uh, and there's no doubt that the Israelis observed every angle of, of 9-11, right? They tracked the, uh, the patsies and they did all sorts of other things. Um, however, what's the context? As I recall, you've got about 25 countries around the world who say after the fact, that they knew this was coming, and they tried to warn the U.S. So within secret intelligence circles, there was a fairly widespread awareness that something very big was about to happen, and the Israelis seem to have gone along with that. Let me just stress again, this does not prove that the Israelis did 9-11. No, 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 no. It proved that they observed 9-11. Fine. That, that implies foreknowledge, but again, the foreknowledge was, according to 25 countries, not the monopoly of the Israelis. So now Trump. Trump says the um, Muslims were applauding and celebrating. Well, at the time this happened, and this is another angle that you should know, um, again, the Israelis put out an old film of some Palestinians celebrating when they were being given some free samples of candy or something. So that also quite uh, dubious. But the main thing I would, I would point to, the structure, the internal emotional epistemological structure of Trump is that this is a great betrayal. It's a stab in the back. He says, we let them come over here, and what do they do? They applaud when the buildings come down. <clears throat> this is a fascist argument in terms of its structure. And I must compare it to the agitation of Hitler in 1920, 21, 22, 23. At this point in Hitler's career, the main theme was not anything to do primarily with the Jewish population of Germany or with other things that he took on later. It was the betrayal of the German army in November 1918. It is the so-called legend of the stab in the back, the Dolchstoss Legenda. This was the uh, centerpiece of Hitler's agitation in the early 1920s. And the argument was, the German army was never defeated in the field, it was unvanquished, and it could have turned around and won the war, but a group of traitors in Berlin, communists, socialists, liberals, Jews, certainly come in at this point uh, in Hitler's demagogy, and all of this is... Um, the substance of this stab in the back legend. So what Trump is offering is a Nazi argument in terms of the the internal structure. Now, as it turned out, the uh, Hitler's charge is false, just like Trump's. Trump's charge is false. Hitler's charge was also false. Uh, and we know this because we have this uh, very interesting American journalist. His name is uh, George Seldes. And he interviewed Field Marshal von Hindenburg, the on paper, the absolute supreme commander of the entire German uh, army. He was interviewed by Seldes right after these events, in other words, within a couple of months. Later on, Hindenburg would go on to essentially buy into the Hitler uh, stab in the back legend. But at this point, still under the shock of the events, Hindenburg says, yeah, we were defeated, and we were actually defeated by the U.S., the American expeditionary force, uh, because they defeated us at Saint Michel. There was the German salient at Saint Michel. And then there was the Battle of the Meuse Argonne. And he says, as a result of the Meuse Argonne, we were defeated. And I can confirm this uh, from, uh, and this is in an interview uh, published by, uh, by George Seldes. I can also confirm, if you read the biography of General Douglas MacArthur, you will find that MacArthur 
uh, with one or two people 